Hi, my name is Richard Best. I live here in Nanaimo and I publish a video series onto YouTube called Humpty's Bass Stravaganza. It follows the adventures of a semi-fictional character named Humpty Dumpling who lives in an old Volvo and uh, as he says he spends one third of his life out fishing and another third of his life recovering from the last time he went fishing and spends the rest of his life getting ready to go fishing again. And I kind of envy that guy in some ways, but in other ways I'm glad I'm not him, although he does look a lot like me. Anyway, uh, as you can guess from the title, a lot of his fishing is, uh, he likes to go bass fishing, and a lot of that fishing comes to place right in this here boat right here, the mighty bullship. So, you can see the basic plan here. Take a piece of super cypress cedar and you whittle it, sand it, and into the shape of a fish. And then uh, you uh, take some, you take a drill and you drill holes in the tail and you install some lead in the stern there put some fins in, give it a paint job, and next thing you know, it looks like a fish, right? And the, it's modeled after a legendary bass lure called a Zara Spook. And the idea is that the, the center of mass is in the stern. So when you twitch this forward, the stern wants to go, wants to keep moving and the bow wants to float. So it absolutely will not go straight. It's either gonna go like that or it's gonna go like that. And if you get a rhythm going, you can uh, go like that. It just, and it's called uh, walking the dog and it's diagnostic of the Zara Spook. And as I mentioned in one of my previous episodes, if you talk about walking the dog with another kind of lure pal, uh, you just look like a dope. And anyway, that's the idea. So you throw these around for bass. Here's another yellow perch imitation, but same concept. You see, this one's eating a little minnow, right? And, uh, anyway, that's the basic plan. So here's a rainbow trout imitation. And you get the idea, right? So I started throwing these around for smallmouth bass here on Vancouver Island and I got some got into some nice fish. I made some episodes of the Bass Stravaganza about that already and lots of video that I never published. But anyway, I started thinking, are there any other fish on Vancouver Island that's intelligent enough to bite on my sophisticated presentation? And if they're certainly not salmon or like rainbow trout or steelhead or cutthroat trout are never going to bite on these, but maybe brown trout. So I made up some special ones uh, with single barbless, just intentionally for the Cowichan River. You can see this one here, it's the same idea, but it's a rainbow trout and it's a single barbless hook, right? And uh, this one here is like a little brown trout, right? A little baby brown trout. And uh, oh, this one here is a beauty. This is a, it started out as a rainbow trout and it gradually evolved into a brown trout and uh, anyway it's got potential to be a good lure and uh, so anyway I decided to take them out and try them out on the river. So to give you an idea of where I'm at uh, if you start out at Scott's Falls from the parking lot I'm pedaling my bike about 45 minutes up the old, it's the old rail grade, the, the College and Greenway I guess and maybe 45 minutes will get you up to the 70 mile trestle. That's where it's legal to start uh, spin fishing. It's fly only above there. About two thirds of the way up, 
uh, there's a logging road that crosses an old logging road and actually guides have got keys to that road and they can drive down there and launch a drift boat from the river down there. So these are a few short clips from one of my previous Pastravaganza episodes. You can see there's see the first one on the road in the morning. Uh, there's an elk hanging out there. He gets out of my way. You can see his big footprints here. He's been digging up the road. You can see the old road that crosses and uh, that pink arrow is down in that area is where the you can drive actually down there and launch a drift boat if you have the key to the road. I don't. You can see the relic channels there indicated with the red lines. The river shifted its course some decades ago. It used to go through there and now it doesn't. You can see further up uh, the blue line there's a, a man-made spawning channel dug in there and uh, I don't think it's legal to fish in there. I don't fish in there. But uh, there are beaver dams in that relic channel. And in springtime, brown trout will go up there to feed on the fry, and you can get brown trout up in that relic channel. So that's where I'm heading to. So I'm going to be fishing within that pink circle, pink oval area behind the beaver dams in that area. And you can see that. Uh, there's a black bear hanging around there, eating skunk cabbage first thing in the spring, and one day there were some otters hanging around in there, lots of fish go up and down there, so I guess the otters eat brown trout too. And you can see the otters heading back down toward the main river there, and I'm going to start fishing where that white arrow is behind the beaver dam that makes that pond. So you can see me sneaking up here stealthily. 30 years ago, I would have crept in there on my hands and knees like a panther silently. Now, when you get uh, old and fat, it's legitimate to just slide along on your fat butt, as long as you don't stand up and spook the fish, because it's very shallow out there. And I'm going to make a practice cast. You've got only one chance here. You're going to either spook them or catch them, one or the other. I'm, I'm not using a topwater lure on this. I'm starting out. It's way too shallow in here. I'm using a tiny little spinner, uh, so I'm going to make a practice cast and then throw it out and hope I don't spook the fish, and who knows if there's one out there or not. Never know until you try. Bingo! Hooked up to a nice Bruno here. I love the jump on this one. You can replay it with the editing, and uh, you can actually flip the video upside down, and you make it look like the fish is actually jumping out of the side of the mountain. So this one is hooked up, and uh, I didn't have a net with me, so I got to bring it into the beach here and make sure my hands are wet, and uh, bring this guy in and uh, have him pose for the bass extravaganza before I let him go. So you can come back here in a few weeks and the water will be down and there might not be another big brown trout up here for another six months, but boy, there was one nice one in here today. So that's a good way to start the day. a nice brown trout. It was about 17 inches, I think. Back into the river with you, buddy. I'll see you in a few years, and you'll be twice that size. So now I'm uh, fishing up behind another one of the beaver dams in here. You can see nobody ever goes in here, so, uh, and I'm in gumboots, so I can't get through this swamp. The deep water's on the other side. But there's fish in there and they're biting on my little spinner. They just keep missing. That one hit and he missed. And you can see my little spinner here. And they're out there, but uh, how do you catch them? And there's another hit. Missed it. A single barbless. And then it comes right. Another hit. Missed it. And then right in this channel. Watch this. Bang! <laughs> right in the weeds there. In that flooded grass. Just a little brown trout. 
but you can see that they're so smart, but they're so aggressive when they get in the mood to fight. So this one goes back in the river. And just upstream from here, I, I got introduced to this place by doing riparian planting back when I was in Camosun College in the 1990s. And, and I hooked a six or seven pound brown trout on a spinner in this very spot. Um, I've been looking forward to it for 20 years to go back there and bang right on the exact same spot. It's changed now and uh, it's not as good as it used to be. This, these channels change a lot as the beavers change uh, their plans and as the floods go by. Oh, I was so, I was sure that was a seven pound brown trout there. So I'm going to switch the camera get my idiot cameraman to point the thing the right direction. Oh, I'm sure that's an eight pounder, maybe 10 pounder. And uh, I'm gonna make another cast in there. I'm sure I'm gonna catch a fish right here. So you can see this spot. It's very hard to get near without waders through the mud and throw it up there. And sure enough, I get another hit. And I am so stoked. I'm so convinced this is gonna be a great big brown trout kind of uh, a little bit of a letdown when it turned out to be not quite as big as I had hoped. But anyway, I did get a bite. So uh, heading up to it, this is a lower spot down by the, down closer to the river here, and that's much shallower than it looks in there. It's hard to throw a spinner in there without snagging on the bottom. So I'm throwing it way up, I'm kind of staying low behind that log there and sure enough I hooked into another brown trout in here and uh, you can see me bringing it in here it's hard to get it uh, hard to get over there in my gumboots <laughs> without getting in over filling up my boots with water so I'm trying to come up with a plan of how to get this fish released and get it to pose for the bass extravaganza before I let him go and I finally did come up with a plan anyway. Another nice little brown trout from these uh, backwater sloughs. Thank you, beavers. I'm really struggling with finding a way to get at this fish without getting water in my gumboots. This is a better spot for waders, actually. The funny thing is, there's a backwater behind the first dam here. And uh, when the water went down, I went back in there. And in my, in all the driftwood and little bits and pieces of wood catch in there. And among the other bits and pieces of flotsam and jetsam, there's a nice little brown trout, huh? There were about 20 flip-flops and other people's shoes that fell off and floated down the river and ended up in the driftwood there. So I'm gonna stop the movie for a moment just to show you this next spot. You can see this another beaver dam I'm sneaking up low behind it. And uh, there's a bunch of grass shielding your view. Now if the cameraman had just broken that grass down before setting up the camera, you could see what you're doing, but he's an idiot and uh, he didn't. So it ruined this beautiful scene. So you can see I'm carefully lining up my cast and then tossing my little spinner in here. And, uh, you know, again, you've only got one chance here. You're either going to spook them or they're going to bite. And uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to catch a fish in a shallow little pond like this. But watch this big brown trout chase my spinner right up almost to my feet. He almost came out of the water after it. I couldn't believe it. Look at him. Just you can see the V wake as he's following that spinner. And you'd think that he was looking right into my eyes, that he would never bite again, but I've got one more possible chance. He might have swum back across to the deeper water on that far shore. I may possibly be able to make a perfect cast back in there. Is there any chance that I right at my feet again? That is a beauty brown trout. That's about three or four pound brown trout right there. Now, look at the idiot cameraman. Why don't you get it in the view, you dimwit? But anyway, you can't see what's going on. But I'm trying to get this fish in. A couple times I got it in by my feet and, and I just spit the hook before I could get it on video. 
you can see it thrashing around in the grass there. That was a beauty, brown trout. And uh, lost forever on video due to the ineptitude of my cameraman. Story of my life. So now switching gears, uh, a little bit later in the spring I went down uh, below Scutts Falls. There's a logging road bridge there and a huge deep pool right below it. And uh, I snuck down there in the middle of the night thinking I might get a hit on one of my homemade topwater lures in there. I threw them all around, never got a bite. But you could hear these brown beards. Every few minutes, you'd hear a sound like a like somebody just slashing a big sword in the water. And of course, it was pitch dark, but you knew it wasn't some conquistador with a sword. It was big brown trout that were they were feeding on the fry that were moving downstream in spring. And so I tried uh, I tried my homemade topwater lures. I tried rapala lures. You think they bite on a rapala lure? They wouldn't bite on a rapala. But I finally was able to get this one on a spinner, throwing a spinner in amongst those feeding brown trout at like two o'clock in the morning. So now this is a little while later. I guess I'm. I'm uh, you can see I've got one of my homemade topwater lures on there. That was a great lure, as it turned out. And this is the first time I'm ever going to try it in the Cowichan River. Throw it around in springtime and see if I can get some brown trout to bite on it. So now I'm back a few days later, and you can see me sneaking up into this big deep pool below those S bends there and you know there's got to be a big brown trout out there so I'm hiding behind this bush heaving my lure out there and watch this giant brown trout come up and just noses at my lure and turns away at the last instant. That was a great big brown trout right there. So I know they will hit it anyway. You can't see this fish, but I was standing there and I did see it. And that was a great big brown trout. That was five pounds plus for sure. But obviously it's hard to get a hook up on that great big wooden lure with a single hook, single barbless hook. So I'm way up to the next pool, throw it out and watch this big brown trout just come up and jump it. And he headed downstream and I had him on for a while, turned to mug for the camera and he spit it out and got away. <laughs> Story of my life. But that was a nice fish there. So now I'm back a few days later. I didn't get nothing at that spot where I got the big swirl the other day. So before I throw out in the deeper water here, I'm going to throw right upstream and let my lure drift along just outside that log, even though I know it's too shallow there. In fact, it's so shallow, I'm not even paying attention. I've given up on this cast and watch this brown trout come charging in and rip at this lure. And it came into such shallow water, it got the eagle excited. And the eagle flew over. You can see me looking up at the eagle. So that's strike one. Let's try another cast. Drifting over the spot where I hooked a big fish the other day. And it looks like there's nothing there, right? It floats right. Look how far this lure floats. And you'd never think there's a big brown trout sitting right under it, tracking it all the way down and gets down into the shallow water. Kaboom! <laughs> At least I'm consistent. Look at that. Like somebody dropping a bomb in the water out there. So, two for two. I move up the street. On the right is actually the outlet of the 
uh, the old relic channel there and throwing it way up toward the top of the riffle there in the backwater and kaboom another nuclear explosion that was a great big fish out there that was a great big brown trout this number three hits in this same pool and I'm just reeling the lure in another one hits it that's four look at that hit and they are not shy they're such you never know there's fish like that in the river by canoeing down the stream and then you throw that lure out there Throw it out again, shift it back right in front of me. There can't be another fish in this pool, right? I mean, it got to be fished out by now. I haven't caught any, but I sure scared them. But darn if there isn't one more in there. Look how long that lure drips down. Finally, it's right out in front of me there. And another big brown trout comes up and shakes us at it. So. That's five in this one spot. Boom. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, I was really frustrated by this point after multiple long bite trips up in there to get at the fish and after all the work I put into these lures and finally found one that got hits, but I just couldn't land these fish. So I did something immoral and also illegal. I swapped over my single barbless hook for a single hook that had a barb on it and uh, I hiked up to the next pool and I was expecting a trail. There's no trail. I had to crash through the bush and I kept hanging my line up. I went to make the first cast into the next spot. The knot was good but the line broke and you could see my wonderful lure snapping right off the tip of my rod sailed right across the river and landed on the gravel bar on the far side. I could see it, but I couldn't get to it. It was gone, gone, gone. 